By way of background, I was born and raised in, in Tehran, Iran. Um, at the time I was born, my family was Iraqis actually, so we were expats in Iran. Um, but naturally, I grew up in Iran, so I spoke Persian and Arabic as I was growing up. When I was 14, we moved to Israel for two years. This will surprise people, but um, it didn't work out well for my family in Israel, so they moved back to Iran after the two years. But then I came straight to the US. I went to, uh, I was still in high school. I was in 11th grade. I went to a boarding school for two years on the East Coast. And then I went to Colgate University um, studying international relations and development studies. Um, that really was my shtick. Um, I had sort of some idealism. I wanted to go back to, you know, Iran and the Middle East and maybe make a difference. Um, I also had some, some possibly delusions of maybe doing some diplomatic kind of work. Anyway, that was the world which I was the most interested in. And like in life, these crazy things happen and you end up going a different direction. So I was finishing at Colgate. Um, I was in last, my last year. I had gotten admission to Columbia School of International Relations, which I was planning on doing in the, in the fall. And um, this is back in the 70s, by the way, so a long time ago. And um, on the East Coast, there's this phenomena, spring break, it's called spring fling, where everyone sort of gets, um, you know, it's, they've been through hellish winters. And I went to Colgate where, you know, we lived with snow, several feet of it, like for months, it seemed like forever. Um, and what happens on spring fling is everyone jumps in a car. You don't stop except for gas. You just drive like for 24 hours, 30 hours, till you get to Florida. You go jump in the water and then you get the fresh orange juice and you feel like, hey, life is here again. Um, so, you know, went on spring fling with a friend. The guy we got a ride from, a guy called Archie Katz, turns out to be like this really unusual character you just meet out of the blue. He was a pre-med student at Colgate, um, but a very unusual pre-med student. He was just an incredibly charismatic fellow. And the previous summer, he had worked as a door-to-door -door vacuum cleaner salesman for Electrolux, the vacuum cleaner. And he had been the number one salesman in the United States. So this is really an incredible talent to be able to do this. And for doing that, he had received a $5,000 award, which was probably the equivalent of maybe about $25,000, $30,000 today. So it was a meaningful sum that he had gotten. Anyway, we're going to Florida. We talk about, I had, the previous year, I had spent five months in India under the India Study Program, a program Colgate had, doing a bunch of stuff on development. It was Green Revolution was going on at the time, a wonderful phenomena. And I was studying it. And during a vacation, I had gone to Afghanistan for two weeks. And I had just fallen in love with this country because you know, we have a Persian expression, it's Afghanistan, Iran is at Salepish. It's like Afghanistan, it's Iran of 100 years ago. So there's very much a feeling of like um, wanting to take care, like this is our history, this is our, I don't know, there's a warm feeling about it. And also like, um, this is sort of the purer case of what we are. I had loved this place. And also Afghanistan was an unusual place because you know, unlike India, Pakistan, parts of Iran, etc., that had really had either occupation or colonization or really they were under the British boot or whatever. Afghanistan wasn't. They had really resisted that and including with like horrific massacres of the British forces. Um, it's interesting, the British would try to lay railroad through like through Afghanistan and through Khyber, etc. And the Afghans would take out the, the railroad lines that they were doing. They'd melt them down into these amazing guns and decorate, you know, these beautifully decorated things, you know, which they used to kill the British. Um, in any case, so one of the things was that it was a country that, at least in our mind, was also was um, 
I don't know, was a purer state or whatever. Anyway, it was a place that I had fallen very much in love with. And so I was telling Archie about this. And Archie was, had never been outside the US. He was, gonna, he was going to medical school the next semester. And he sort of, you know, so over the course of this vacation, we cooked up this deal, my first business deal, where we were each going to pay for our own travel expenses. But, um, but he was going to, you know, we were going to use the 5,000 that he had won to, quote, buy some cool stuff. That's how we described it. Come back, you know, a few weeks before school start, sell it, make a bundle, hopefully make a lot more money than our classmates who were typically being waiters and room, you know, waiters to earn something for the summer. And, you know, go back to school. I was going to my graduate program, he was going to his. That was the idea. Um, this thing, um, so we went to, I'm going to be talking about this in depth, the result of that. But to make a long story short right now, this led to the creation of this really successful business, which had just unbelievable level of press coverage. That was one of the main things that really kept it. The fashion business came out of this, this seemingly crazy trip, which I ended up doing for the following eight or nine years, Kandahar Designs. This company really grew. It was a fashion company. Initially, it was just the US. Then it went to, we did Europe and, and Japan, and it went global. It became like, you know, it, you know about 1,000 people were, start, were actually directly or indirectly employed as a result of this venture. And it was really sort of a formative experience for me, um, you know, as a business person, as an entrepreneur, et cetera. So that's one of the dangerous things, guys. Whatever you do for the first few years of your career, it's not only the start and where you go, but the style of that, et cetera, is you're going to be stuck with it for your life. So those are really important, both the good and the bad. And there's a lot to be said that's good about the fashion industry. And there's a lot to say that's really horrific about it. And I'm stuck with both. In any case, sticking with the bio, after that, that was a fiasco for me. It was really like a disaster at the conclusion of that. That venture concluded when the Russians invaded Afghanistan. And I proceeded to misread that as well. So you think as a strategist, I'd make, get these things right. I completely blew that, that strategic decision to, to my detriment. Um, in any case, I had a few years where I was really lost in the desert, where I really didn't know what to do. I wasn't, I, it wasn't clear I was employable in any way. And so in, what do you do when you have nothing else to do? I went to business school. That's what brought me to California, actually. And that was really a wonderful experience in that it helped really sort of reposition me. Because I'll tell you, be, being sort of like, you know, yeah, I did this company in Afghanistan. That does not get you any jobs. That's, that, if anything, is a big signal. Stay away from this guy. Um, business school sort of helped repackage me into sort of a more sellable commodity. And I, frankly, being out here, it became clear the, all the entrepreneurial opportunities and the excitement was in technology. So after that, I went into technology. Initially, just I had a, I had a pricing job at company called Tandem Computer, a very interesting company that was acquired long ago. Um, and I was there briefly, and then I left. I did a set of turnarounds. Um, and ultimately, the turn I came back as part of a turnaround team to Tandem. And that was really turned out to be like a really um, pivotal event in my career, um, that turnaround, in that when we came back to Tandem, Tandem, which had been this really amazing rocket, had crashed at this point to the point where like the market cap on the on New York Stock Exchange for the company was about eight hundred million dollars. And earlier I was telling you turnarounds are really where some serious money can be made. Believe it or not, um, a year and nine months later, it was acquired by Compact for three point four billion dollars. So like something like over two billion dollars of value, two and a half billion in value got created. What's more, that was when the announcement was done. By the time the deal closed, you know, and it was a stock deal, it had climbed to like 4.3 billion dollars. So at that point, I, you know, 
I had the wherewithal to do my own venture fund. I had been doing ventures as part of the turnaround work, as part of my corporate work, and I figured, you know, I want to have the full independence to do it. So I started a company called Palo Alto Ventures, and um, we were doing normal venture capital, but we were also doing corporate venture capital, which is really a specialty, and it's different in that where you're doing the ventures for a corporate client, and your goals are not just financial results, but strategic benefit for the parent, strategic benefit for the investor, as well as the venture being invested in. That's a whole space which is really, really fascinating, and that's an area where my expert, probably my deepest expertise is in corporate venture capital. Um, that, was a, that was a wonderful and interesting experience. We ended up getting Philips Electronics as a client, and we did all their venture investing in Silicon Valley. And having a player like that made for some very interesting things. I have, when I talk about scenarios, I use the Philips as, a, as an example, and it's a pretty fascinating story. Um, one of the things it really shows you is just the power of thought. You know, how much can be accomplished, how much value can be created just with thought, just with ideas. It really is quite remarkable. In any case, we did that. One of our key, the two key things that came out of that Philips initiative, which are maybe interesting, one is we were one of the early backers of a company called TiVo. Are you guys familiar with TiVo? It's a television extension. Anyway, this was a huge win. And to give you a flavor for some of these, this was a case where we invested 10 million on behalf of Philips in TiVo. About eight and a half months later, um, we had liquidity on 190 million. So there was like a 19 to one return in, in a very, very tight time frame. You see these kinds of deals in this kind of business. So in any case, did Palo Alto Ventures, um, which was a, you know, which was definitely a success. Um, I ran that for several years, and then in 2003 and four, we we looked at having it sold. It was acquired by 21st Century Venture Partners. They're still operating out of Palo Alto successfully. Um, that's when I did Live Wall which was that venture which I mentioned to you earlier. I thought it's going to be my defining venture. It was a complete bomb. I recovered by doing Euro Profile, which was a, you know, which was a big success. Um, Euro Profile, as you know, was sold again. Yes? What did you sell uh, Palo Alto Ventures for? I can't disclose the numbers because of the agreement, but it was a, it was a healthy number. Um, and frankly, they, one of the main things they were interested in was, was the goodwill. They were interested in the portfolio, but it was really the goodwill they were really interested in. We, had had, we were the only firm that had used scenario-based scenario planning as a tool for investing. And it's a very, very powerful tool. So, and we had gotten some visibility for that. So, um, In any case, um, I then... Um, you know, we're getting right to approximately now. The, the venture I started after the so sale of Europe Profile um, is, a, is a small venture based in, it was originally ta it was targeting online consumer lead generation. We started it in France. Um, it failed in France. We shifted the whole operation to Brazil in a that's not a very easy thing to do. Um, and we're, we're fighting the good fight right now. The jury's out on what's going to happen with, um, it's a company called Vem. And Brazil, it's a very, very interesting marketplace right now. We have someone from Rio in our, on our, in our group here. Um, so that is my background. Let's shift now to something a little bit, and which brings me, which brings me here. Um, the path I mentioned, so it really was like, I come out of school, I basically, obviously I had nothing, 
we do this Kandahar Designs, this company, I'm gonna tell you about the Afghan thing, and it's like mind blowing, you know, you're rocketing to the point where it crashes. So do I know failure where now you're completely unemployable, you've really blown it, you've done no advanced planning for failure. Like I made every possible mistake on that first round. You know, you go lateral, you go to school. You know, I went to school, you know, I came back, you know, sort of had some, had some success had another mini crash, which I didn't mention, led me to the turnaround, a huge success, followed by a couple successes, then a giant failure again. So it's, I don't know, it's part of the, it's been part of this, this route. So I think I have seen failure. Now, my first failure in Afghanistan. You've heard some of the background already, so I can go through this quickly. Um, you know, as I mentioned, the scheme with $5,000. And so we went off to Afghanistan via Delhi. At the time, you couldn't fly between the US and Afghanistan, you know, directly. And you got to understand, Afghanistan in those days was really, really a different thing that, you know, now you hear Afghanistan, and I, I don't know, the first thought that comes to mind is death and terrorism and, you know, fear and, you know, it's just been, you know, that country's gone through 20 years between like the Russian invasion and then all the bloodletting internally and then the American invasion. This is not the Afghanistan that it was like in the 70s. Afghanistan was like this pure, un, you know, place that, you know, had not been dominated by the colonial powers. And I don't know, it was just a, a wonderful, wonderful place. And people from Asia, from Europe, from the US and Europe, youth, there was this incredible movement, which we used to joke about called Youth in Asia, where you know, people would just be traveling and like Kabul was like the dream place because of all the reasons I told you. Um, and so we thought, okay, we're, we're doing this business, we have this $5,000, if you remember, we're gonna be spending over the next few months. Guess what, we land in Delhi, and now we're gonna go overland to, to Afghanistan. Right in Delhi, we fall in love with this amazing Bengal tiger skin, the most giant, the most beautiful, amazing thing. You see an example up there, and this guy at this shop says, yeah, it's illegal to export from India, but no problem, I can get it out for you. It's no sweat importing to the US. He was an amazing salesman, we were naive. We spent more than half our capital, we spent $2,600 buying this tiger skin. Our first element. We then went to, Af got to Afghanistan after a couple weeks and you know, we were wondering, what should we buy here? And the thing that had been hot was these sheepskin coats, but they had been done. So we were thinking, look, we gotta do something new. Let's just figure out what else we can do that might be new. We see these guns, these beautiful guns, which are made with, you know, British metal. And, you know, you can see this gorgeous mother, and mother of pearl inlay and bone inlay and metal inlay. And these are working guns and they cost like $5, $10. Now I'll tell you, I had never held a gun in my hand in my life. You know, in Iran, you know, you don't, you know, guns are not allowed, et cetera. But, you know, and I didn't come like from a hunting family. So neither Archie nor I had even held a gun in our hand, leave alone shooting one before, leave alone knowing anything about old guns or the gun market or the collector's market, you know. But we see these things, we love them. And guess what, there was a like, side thing. Collecting these guns is gonna be crazy fun. Because you're gonna get on horseback, you're gonna be going to village areas, a lot of it you're gonna have to do with trading. And so as an experience, it's gonna be amazing. So we ended up spending almost the whole summer collecting them. We collected 184 rifles. It came up to over two tons of rifles that we had collected in Kabul, and we're gonna ship them to the States. So now it's getting to the end. We only have like about eight, nine days left in Afghanistan. And hey, we still have about $1,000. Well, we had a friend 
who had a clothing, who did clothing, etc. And he really talked us into buying these men's wedding shirts. They're, you know, white rayon with like white on white embroidery. So it's the same color being embroidered on top of it. It's gorgeous, etc. We thought, hey, yeah. So we got a thousand of these at 80 cents a piece, $800, and we had spent up our money, you know, thinking, and we had a really, oh, we also thought, hey, once we do it, guess what? Like while I'm at Columbia, while he's at Chicago, you know, guess what? We should have our suppliers lined up. So beyond this first shipment, you know, maybe we'll bring in more guns. Maybe we'll bring in more shirts. Um, so this was our gun dealers. These guys were, t these were the two guys that we used to go out into the country with to buy the guns. And these guys were the shopkeepers who were the masters of these guys. And this was their place in Kandahar. And we had also, you know, we also had our, our clothing suppliers here. These were the guys, Haji Mamad, Haji Maulana Ghulam Mamad, Haji Mamad. And so we we're all set to go. And, but the main point was, it was an incredibly fun summer. It really was amazing. We come back to the US and reality faces us, and I think you have an idea. This isn't going to go well. So first of all, um, my visa got delayed. I still had, was traveling on an Iranian passport. You know, the US embassy, they, they delayed my visa. So I missed the first three weeks of Columbia. Therefore, I couldn't start that semester. I deferred to the following semester. Um, and the Bengal tiger skin got here, and it got confiscated by US Customs. And it was really bad. And it was like a shock to us. Um, so we still had the guns. We had like these two tons of guns, rifles. Guess what? The rifles came in duty free as <laughs> antiques. So you know what the country's encouraging. Um, but there was no market at all. I mean, I remember we were in upstate New York. We went to a gun show. And like we walked in, first of all, you know, the guns they were showing were these high performance rifles and German guns and stuff. And we walk in these things. And besides that, we didn't even look like the people that were at this. You know, it's like, who are these weirdos? <laughs> and stuff. So anyway, we didn't, you know, we couldn't sell these things. We could sell a few to our buddies, but you know, that's not a business exactly. And the wedding shirts, the quality was a disaster. I mean, they were beautiful things if you had the one, but you know, Whoever was putting the sizes on these things was on LSD or something, because like there was no relation. You know, things would have like big splotches on them. You know, they were really, you know, they were a mess. Um, but there was a silver lining. Okay, if you went through like these thousand shirts and like chose one of the better ones and then like really washed it and cleaned it, or what you could do with, with spots, you could just dye it black or dye it like dark green or brown or something. It's kind of, it's not as obvious where the spot is and stuff. If you could do that, so, you know, guess what? In my, my student apartment, you know, five, six of us have these giant vats where we're dying. People are like pressing, we're learning to press. You know, we're putting new size labels on. When you did it, when you put this stuff through this process, the things that came out of it, there really was a demand, and you could sell them. So we started just taking these things to you know, a lot of these boutiques that were emerging at the time. It was a new channel that was emerging in the US, you know, in college towns like our own. And you know, we'd, they'd either buy some from us, or they would say, look, we'll put it on consignment. And you know, come back in a few weeks, you, know, you get half the money that's generated by the sale. So we started doing these, and it sold, and they were selling, you know, reasonably well. Um, but then we faced a collection problem. One of the guys, the guys in a boutique where Cornell University is, you know, we gave him these things. He wasn't giving us the money, so we kept going back. Listen, hey, you sold them; they're not here. Pay us. He said, I'll pay you. I'll pay. I'll tell you in a month or something. I just don't have it right now. So finally, he turns to us and he says, "Listen, I have, you know." I owe you this money, that's right, it's for three dozen of these shirts, I owe it, I'll pay it to you. But if you want, I'll give you another option. I have a booth 
at a New York fashion and boutique show. If you're willing to forfeit what I owe you for half my booth, we have a deal and hey, this is paid off. Hey, you get to see New York. I hear this. I figure we're probably never going to see this money anyway. And besides New York, you know, we're 22. A show, this, yeah, sure, let's do the deal. We do the deal. You know, we go to New York and like talk about an intimidation city. You know, this is like a professional show with, you know, companies spending millions on exhibition and on, you know, doing this, this really right. So we're just sort of watching there, like how the hell do we play this game? But we waited till everyone sort of was done. Then, you know, working late into the night, we just tried to mimic them, really like little monkeys. You know, okay, they hang it this way, let's do it the same way. We started putting together a display of these samples we had gotten. And I paid to mention, I got back in touch with that Haji Mahmad, those three guys that you saw, saying, hey, we're doing a show, send me some samples. There was a Dutch girl who had stopped by their store, had done, I don't know, 15, 20 things, and they thought they were kind of interesting. So they had made a sample for, them, for me as well from the things that she was doing for her own wardrobe. Um, so they sent me a bunch of things. They sent me a box of stuff, including these, but a lot of other stuff too, you know, of their own invention. These were some samples. These were the samples that we had put up on the wall here. We go, we crash at a friend's house in New York, actually the cousin of a friend of ours who had a flat in New York. You know, we went to bed at like around 3 o'clock. The show starts at 9. We wake up at 10, 30, 11. Oh my God, we're late for the show. Let's run. We run there. And I'll tell you, you know, like you guys, especially the business students, you hear a lot of people talk about like, we had this great vision, we brought it together. You don't hear much about chance and luck. I'll tell you, chance and luck are so huge. They're so amazing. I mean, this was one example. We were winners before we showed up. While we were crashing and sleep oversleeping, a couple editors from Mademoiselle magazine had been cruising the things. They see these things. They fit exactly the, their view of what what should be happening, and they're loving it. They're bringing their friends who are buyers at Bloomingdale's and Ben Dell's and et cetera to check this out. So by the time we get there, literally people had taken off the sheet we had on the rack. There was like notes all over the place from like retailers, from magazines, you know, showing, expressing interest in this thing. And we're like, we can't believe this thing is happening. This is so crazy. So fun. Um, and these were some of the first editorial coverage that we got. Now some of these you can see, it really goes back to some, like some of this is very much goes back to the roots of things available in Afghanistan originally. You know, very, very limited modifications had been done. This is one of the things that that Dutch girl had done for herself. Um, But we are basically a hit in New York. We get like 35 retailers, say, all over the country. They're going to be carrying this collection. Um, you know, and as I said, this whole emerging boutique category, they love this stuff. Like, there's really, really demand. And, you know, we're getting a ton more press over the course of the next four days. You know, we get more press. So I'd like to introduce this term pivot which is really key to startup language, et cetera, you know, in Silicon Valley. So obviously we didn't know these terms at the time, but what, this was a pivot for us. All of a sudden, now we had some definition. We were no longer gun importers. We were no longer, you know, tiger skin vendors. We were a clothing manufacturer, a clothing um, importer. So I go off to Kandahar to my suppliers to produce. Now think about it. You're trying to bring together this mentality with this mentality. These things are so far from each other, it's really unfathomable. I mean, these guys, their understanding, Molan Roland Mamad's understanding of like her needs is really, 
ludicrous to say the least. So, you know, we, you know, we get, you know, they produce some stuff for us. Guess what? It's junk. You know, frankly, the demand, you know, people want it so much, they're willing to put up with a lot of stuff, but they're not willing to put up with total junk. And, you know, some of it we get junk. And we, what do we know? We're working with first principles. So naively, we go back to all our mind. We say, listen, this is junk. You need to have it better quality. Look, we're going to pay you 20% more. 20%. You see our price list? You know, these guys are used to negotiating their brains out. We're saying, we're going to pay you more. Give us good quality. For sure. Absolutely. You're going to get great quality. We get it back. Junk. It's really junk. You're getting really frustrated. Look, I want to deal with the tailors. No, you can't deal with the tailors. No, you're, you're a big executive. You're Mr. from Iran and stuff. No, no, we'll take care of it. Trust me. Anyway, in frustration, oh, the other thing is after a while, it becomes a nightmare, not only in production, but it becomes a nightmare of negotiations. Because now they shipped you junk, you've gotten a hit, you're fighting over the last shipment, the new shipment's coming, you know, you're fighting for prices, you realize, hey, this 20% I gave them is junk, we're still getting the old junk, I want the old price. It, gets, uh, it starts getting ugly, and you find all this effort is going into negotiating and, and fighting, and you start doing tricks on them, and they're doing tricks on you, not a good scene. So that's when we started improvising. I finally told this guy, we were, by the way, I should just give a side note. Pricing in Afghanistan at the time, that in those days, was so rude, it, it was, things were so cheap, it was absurd. It really was kind of mind blowing. Like I had the hotel I stayed in, we were in a small hotel. You know, one of the nicest ones in Kabul. I mean, nice in the sense that it was a nice house converted to a hotel. Um, the price was 20 afts a night. It was, I think, 80 afts to the dollar. So like, my hotel room cost like 25 cents a night. You could have like a really nice kebab, like eight skewers and stuff, for 10 afts, for like, I don't know. You know, you could spend the whole day traveling, eating, entertaining. It's like, yeah, I spent like 95 cents today or something. It was really, you know, things were crazy. If you wanted to rent a, a house, I think it was like a beautiful house and like a good section of town was like $140 a month or something. This is like a beautiful garden, servant's quarter. I mean, it's crazy. Prices were really absurd. So one day I go to like the the floor boy, they used to call him in those days. It's a guy, you know, it's like, a, you could think, I'm in American terms, assistant floor manager of the hotel. And I say, listen, come with me, take me to the bazaar. I want to go to the bazaar where the tailors that make men's suits work. Those are the most, you know, in that mentality, they're the most skilled tailors. And I want to have that, I want to make, have one of these guys do something for us directly where we're working directly with the tailor. So, here's Karim. He was the assistant manager at the hotel. We did this, we take it to three tailors, and then we get a rented house. This was my original startup team in Kabul. I know these guys, I know each of these guys really, really well. I know each of their families fairly well. Like really, the kind of bond that we could really build in this case was amazing. And this was a, you know, guess what? This seems like, what'd you do? You sort of get frustrated, you go get one tailor, before you know it, you get like 20 of them. Guess what, this is now by Silicon Valley terms, we made a major pivot at this point. We went from being an importer, where you're not controlling the production at all, to now we were a manufacturer. But the most amazing part was that we shifted to a completely collaborative environment. At this point, these tailors, these are men's suit tailors, they have a lot of pride in what they do, and we're willing to pay. There is no issues about quality. I mean, there's, you still need process for quality. You still need quality control. You need you know, quality control at the raw material. You still need to do all these process things. But it's not like you're fighting each other left and right. That energy is all gone, and it's all going towards a positive 
direction. Also, frankly, from our perspective, the huge part of the margin which that intermediary was getting had disappeared, so it was available to get to, to others, to get to workers. The next thing was we realized we had totally lucked out, really pure luck. Um, we had totally lucked out in that that Dutch girl had happened to go into that shop in Kabul and had done some things. We realized, you know, there's going to be a thousand people entering this space. We need design that that can really make a difference for us. So we hired our first designer, a really talented person, Ann Sheldon, in Boston. And frankly, the editorial support started really you know, going, you know, extremely strong and, you know, further rocketing, really. Are we all set? Great. So now, again, Pivot 3 happened. We've shifted from being a manufacturer to a designer. I'd like to give you a feeling for both the product and for the, for the economics. Um, this is an Afghan chador, a veil. It's a beautiful, beautiful object. Frankly, I have, I have a few in the next break. I'll bring them in and you can play with them. Um, this is a mass item in Afghanistan. You know, there's millions of these things produced for the local population. So the cost has been optimized to death. Making one of these is a huge amount of work. There's Tons of hand embroidery defining the eyepiece so that you can look through. There's hand pleating, which is really, the whole back is this beautiful hand pleated stuff. And being a mass item, guess what? This item in Kabul, I think the price I'm trying to remember was 125 or, so was, if you went for really the top quality was $1.75, okay, for the veil. Now, this veil and this dress, which ended up getting, I can't tell you how many editorial coverages it got. We got, you know, that dress was in Cosmopolitan magazine alone four times. Um, this is exactly one veil. This is taking a veil and cutting and pasting it into a different object. So the direct labor was 55 cents. We had unbelievable benefits program we started because of the crazy profitability of the venture. You know, where we were covering health issues for employees, we were doing profit sharing. Add another 40 cents for indirect costs. The total cost freight on board in Kabul, $2.70. Shipping, customs, brokerage. Total cost of goods sold is $4.97. The retail price we were working was 150 to $450. With these kinds of margins, there is room for crazy experimentation, there's room for fun, there's room for growth. So we were selling it wholesale at $70. That's for domestic. In Europe, I mean, the 450 was more in London where it was going for like 200 pounds, 150 pounds. So, this gives you a feel for the kinds of things that, it, that you can do. It really does enable pioneering employee benefits. I remember when we first suggested it to Karim, saying, hey, look, we're thinking maybe we should start doing a thing where if the tailors are sick or if their family is sick, we take care of it. We don't have to do it as an official thing because, frankly, we want it to be below the radar. But let's just do it. Frankly, the, our management team would say, no, 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 you can't do this in Afghanistan. This will be really dangerous. If you do this, you know, they'll be demanding. How do we know it's really their family that might be a far cousin that they so, got sick and they're doing it and stuff? It was like, it's OK, man. It's, you know, that's fine. We want to do it. And it's, you know, even if there's some fraud in it, there's going to be some fraud in all kinds of things. I'll tell you, it was incredibly satisfying. And I think you, you'll see it with some of these um, I mean, this was a dream opportunity for me for so many, from so many dimensions. I told you that, Iran of 100 years ago. I mean, I wanted to do development. This was direct development. My dream had been working with the UN development program. When I was in India, in India and I'd gone to Afghanistan, those were the first people I'd visited in Kabul, the UNDP program. 
I knew what that was like. That was primarily administrative work. Here it felt like, man, we're really doing it directly. And you could see the impact occurring. Like, you know, we hired particularly this one, out of this one tribe. Primarily we started with them, in part because I was Iranian. The Hezara tribe, which has been very much a downtrodden group in Afghanistan. So naturally what happens, you know, and it's a really good situation. They're bringing people from their own village, from their own relatives, etc. So you could see like the impact of this thing even on the villages that they were in. At the same time, remember, we were in our 20s. We were like 22, 23 years old. This whole idea of being in the New York and LA fashion scene, which was fast and fun and wild, and this is the 70s, it's like, how, you know, how good can it get? It was also a dream opportunity in the sense that it really was a team of close friends. I felt like Karim and Sadiq, they were the two leaders of the operation. I felt like they really were my brothers. I mean, with the kind of bond that we felt together was amazing. This was the original core team in Boston, too. Um, these people, I mean, you know, that was also an incredible bond. We are still close. Two of these people I've talked into moving to Palo Alto, out of wherever they've been. I mean, I really, you know, unfortunately, Ann Sheldon is dead, but everyone else, we're still in regular cut contact with each other. I mean, I really see, like, this element, you know, both the Afghan dimension and the original U.S. team, you know, one of the most satisfying elements of all this. And then we got a lucky break. I mean, here, all these good things happen. Plus, Yves Saint Laurent, the great French designer, he did a collection which was like all ethnic. This is an image from it. And it was really like, I mean, it looked like it was influenced by our stuff. Obviously, it wasn't. Obviously, it was original work that he was doing. But for us, it was like, you know, out of the blue, all of a sudden, the phone's going crazy. The demand is really going crazy. Um, so at this point, we decided, hey, it's time to go global. So we entered the major European exhibitions, you know, starting with a press offensive. Now, I've got to tell you, the idea of an American design team going to the Pret-a-Porter in Paris and exhibiting at the time was viewed as ludicrous because all the flow fashion-wise was coming from France and Europe to the US. The idea that an American design team is going to go there and succeed, it was crazy. The Commerce Department was, you know, basically this was all of a sudden, it was export of American design resources was fundamentally what was happening because all the manufacturing was happening there, but, you know, but the value add was happening from at the design level. You know, so, you know, Commerce Department was like, what can we do for you guys? This is like insane. Um, anyway, we went to the European shows and the thing scaled. So out of this crazy beginning that I told you about, you know, a bunch of students, you know, doing, buying guns and tigers and things, you know, we ended up with a real company with like a bunch of people, um, you know, massive expansion in Afghanistan, you know, clear readership and a retail following. The wealth effect, I mean, it had a huge wealth effect in Kabul in Afghanistan. I mean, that guy Kareem and Sadiq, you know, the house boy at that hotel now had a Mercedes and a driver and a team of, you know, I don't know how many and et cetera. Frankly, the team ourselves, that motley crew that we were showing, you know, we were now living well, we were traveling well, you know, because, hey, we had some scale and we had, you know, we had a following. Um, but also, I'll tell you, over the course of the seven years, I know our cost structure started getting loose. There was some strategic sloth. Like there was a time when our, the market's quality was here and our quality was like, was up here. At this point, you know, they had risen and we had risen a bit, but hey, the gap wasn't what it was. And finally, I think it's important to say, while we were doing fashion, and it wasn't, quote, pure ethnic, we were still dry riding that ethnic trend because of the materials we were using. And that trend itself was also aging. Um, 
But I think it's important to say, and one of the reasons for this slide here was that it's like this, a lot of the craziness was at the beginning, but then this thing just sort of got established at a pretty high level and started writing at that level. Um, and then geopolitical turmoil happened. The Iranian revolution and the fall of the Shah, some argue indirectly that led to the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan, but in any case, the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan was obviously a huge event for us, and it started creating all kinds of logistical problems as well. So once the Soviet invasion happened, I remember um, going to, you know, when we were in Kabul, you gotta remember, it was this tiny little town we had one other competitor, a company called Hindu Kush, which was smaller than us, but they also had scale. They were also selling to the good stores, et cetera, you know, high margin goods, et cetera. This is him, Tom Freston, and this is Jill Thompson, his designer. You know, they used to hang out in Kabul, and of course I spent a lot of time in Afghanistan, so we used to cruise together, you know, like, I don't know, at least two, three times a week, we'd get together for dinner and hanging out, you know, late into the evening. So we had really become friends. So I remember at this point Tom said, Ellie, you know, this gig is up. It's been what an amazing ride it's been, but I have a feeling it's over. And I was like, what do you mean it's over? No. He said, look, this is an invasion. This is gonna, you know, this ain't gonna work. And it was like, no, look, man, look, we went through the coup d'etat. Remember when there was a coup, the, uh, the cousin took over against the king and stuff? You know, all hell broke loose. We thought it's, you know, it's gonna be over. It wasn't, we survived it. Then the earthquake happened, we thought, oh my God. Yes, we survived it. We'll survive the invasion. He said, no, you're crazy. This is a different animal entirely. Anyway, I was a man of my convictions, so we acquired Hindu Kush. We doubled down on it at this point, in spite of all these things. Needless to say, a really horrific strategic decision. Um, as a side note, so Tom, Tom Freston at that point, leaves this tail between, we do a deal where for the next nine months, um, Tom and his partner, you know, we can call on them really at will. They'll work with us, they'll do the shows for us. As part, that was part one of the terms of the acquisition. Um, here's Tom feeling like his world has just ended because this wonderful, beautiful company he was doing, he's just sold, and he sold it not for a lot of money because, hey, you know, it was based on the premise that, hey, this is gonna be over with. Guess what he does as his next step? Failure, really. Failure also means rebirth. Believe it or not, Tom started MTV as his next move. <laughs> Tom was chairman of MTV till two and a half, three years ago. MTV was the most profitable media property in all history. Sometimes you need the failure to take the next step. But I wasn't doing MTV, I was still doing this thing. And the thing starts getting worse and worse. The logistical situation gets worse. We start losing money in large numbers because guess what, it's fashion and timing is everything. You spend a ton you know, at the beginning of the season showing your designs, you get these contracts. If, you know, and these contracts say delivery by this date. You don't do that date you're now, it's an open negotiation. You might get one third the money that you were gonna get. I mean, it's really, it can devastate you. And even worse, we started, Taylor started disappearing, literally being gone, gone, forever gone, kind of from this picture. And ultimately it failed. We had to shut it down. There's a whole bunch of failures I had in here worth talking about. First and foremost, there was an obvious failure on my part and the leadership of this company to diversify our sources of production at all. Even though we had seen some of the, what was coming downstream. This was a cataclysmic, this was a cataclysmic failure for the Afghan tailors. And I can't tell you what it, this really did to me personally, because you saw what had happened. 
and we were in the process where they were basically going to have to go. And now you had like really large numbers of people that were completely dependent on this operation. Luckily, they had some savings, this, that, the other. But the, guts, the heart of the matter is that this was a cataclysm for them. I had had a major personal failure. I had not built a nest egg, and my family was now in jeopardy. I, was, I had a wife, and I had a four-year-old son, and my wife was pregnant. I viewed myself as completely unemployable, frankly. I mean, it was a joke if you tell someone, what have you done? Yeah, I did this thing in Afghanistan. Where is that? What is, is that in Africa? What, you know, it's really like, you know. Um, and also when we did this company, it was like really there was so, there was no boundary between this is me, this is the company. A huge mistake. So like, did I have a savings account? Did I, had I bought a house for myself? Had I, you know, had I done any, done any of the things you do, you know, if you're building a family and, you know, you, you, no. Obviously, self-worth is in tatters, unable to make a living. And sort of, I was wandering the desert for a couple years. Sorry. So, at one point I say, so we had left it. I actually sold Power Kandahar Designs. I went on a tour to our European distributors to say, look, we're shutting it down. What's weird is our, our London distributor says, I love this collection. How could you shut it down? No, no, I'll buy it. I told him, listen, man, I, I've been there. I had this conversation. I told him the conversation with Tom Freston. Guess what? He did buy it. And guess what? He did make a go of it. What he did, the way he did it was he purely went with the brand and with the customer base. But he shifted all production to Afghan, to India. You know, he went through a horrible transitional period. But he ended up having a successful company. So I was obviously wrong about the saving of it. But the fact is, the way we were doing it and the way we saw it, it was so tight, closely wrapped up with Afghanistan and the tailors, it would have been unthinkable for us to do that. So anyway, I tried to do an attempt at a sal salvaging operation. And sometimes you'll experience that. You have a big failure. At first, you, you, know, you give up. And then at a certain point, you say, well, maybe I can still save something from that old thing. Bad idea. Anyway, I gave it a whirl. We did a company called Dada. It was really a kick of the dying mule attempt. It was a lovely collection we did. But from a business perspective, it was, it was over. Now, was this a failure? <coughs> of course it was a failure. I mean, it ultimately failed in a big, gigantic, horrific way. And a lot of the people affiliated with it felt like they had you know, been hit by a truck. The thing is, though, this, with the failure is always this opportunity. You know, I told you about Tom Freston, you know, about myself. Would I have ever left the fashion industry if I had a choice? No way. I saw myself as a fashion person. I saw myself as in that world. My friends were photographers. You know, it was, it was from that circle. I'd have never done it. So people sometimes say, oh, it's so interesting. You've had your career. You've had all these different phases. It's always been because I've been booted out hopelessly and don't have a prayer of staying in what it was I was doing. It's not like I, you know, boldly thought, hey, I'm going to leave all this stuff. I'm going to this, this new path. So with the failure comes this opportunity. And there's a great Chinese farmer story I'd love to actually read to you, if I may, for a moment. There's a Chinese story of an old farmer who had an old horse for tilling his fields. One day, the horse escaped into the hills. And when all the farmer's neighbors sympathized with the old man over his bad luck, the farmer replied, bad luck, good luck, who knows? A week later, the horse returned. 
with a herd of wild horses from the hills. And this time, the neighbors congratulated the farmer on his good luck. His reply was, good luck, bad luck, who knows? Then, when the farmer's son was attempted to tame one of the wild horses, he fell off its back and broke his leg. Everyone thought this was very bad luck, not the farmer, whose only reaction was, good luck, bad luck, who knows? Some weeks later, the army marched into the village and conscripted every able-bodied youth they, could, they found there. When they saw the farmer's son with his broken leg, they let him go. Now, was that good luck, bad luck? Who knows? <laughs> Thank you very much.